Hello, everybody. This is a live stream. I'm going to be copying this link so that I can paste it into Canvas, and then I will have ready to go. Okay. So, oops, let's go ahead and send out an email. All right. Okay, we are streaming. So tonight's lecture is going to cover uh, stellar magnitude. Before I do the lecture, I do want to do a quick review. Um, so we're going to review some of the concepts of the uh, coordinate systems tonight so that you can then be ready when I do give you a quiz on coordinate systems. Um, by the way, there are some resources that I'd like you to know about before we even get started. Let's go ahead and take a quick look right here. Um, so let's see, I am looking at our Canvas site. I'm gonna turn off the light so you can see it better. And um, let's see, if you look right here, uh, a couple of things, let's see. I don't actually have a quiz up. Oops, okay, those kind of files right here. Take a look, and here are your study guides. And you can find a coordinate systems. Here we go. Coordinate systems uh, file right here, which goes over all of the coordinate systems that we've learned about. They are the terrestrial, right? Terrestrial, which just means the planet Earth. The horizontal, which it means from our point of view, wherever we are standing, what does the sky look like? We are the center of the system. And the third system is called the equatorial, which is the celestial sphere. Uh, so that's available for you uh, on Canvas. Uh, if you look, you do have a new homework assignment coming up, which is uh, page 12A. And uh, we'll talk about that during the live stream so you'll understand what to do. So I, I just discovered something really cool I'm super excited about. I found out that this program called Solarium is actually available right in your web browser, which is kind of neat, right? And so you can actually you go to stellarium-web.org and, and it shows you the constellations. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can actually turn on the constellation lines, which is kind of cool, right? You can see all these constellations that we've been doing. Um, and you put on the artwork too, right? And um, yeah, kind of cool. There's another neat thing that you can do if you click this little three lines over here. Um, it can actually, you can do some things here. You can add a meridian line or an ecliptic line, right? Remember, the ecliptic is the path that the sun follows through the sky. And the meridian is the middle of the sky, right? So if I look right here, the meridian stretches from north to south, going through the zenith point, exactly cutting the sky. If the sun were crossing this line, we know that it would be 12 noon, local noon. Now, I don't quite see how to, oh, there we go. You can actually just, oh, that's awesome. Oh, my gosh, that's so cool. Oh, my gosh. So look at that, right? So you can actually just scoot forward. Oh, I didn't even have to do that. I could actually I just scoot forward using the time button, right? Okay. That is awesome. Okay, seriously. Okay, now why do you say 1300? You guys know why? Because we are in daylight savings time. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, we're trying to look at the sky. I just wanted to show you a few things. We can change, let me turn off those lines again. Keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Okay. So this is kind of a neat tool. In fact, you can practice your constellation. So I could actually, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but do you guys see? Let's see. It doesn't look quite like the planetarium, does it? But if you look right here, you can see the Delta of Orion. So this would be Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel is already showing, and Seis. 
Here's Sirius, right? What's the name of this star? Anybody? Procyon, right? And if you click it, it tells you. If you click, so this actually clicked. Beetlejuice. This one is cool. Sour tricks. Rigel, we already know. And Bayer. Bayer. And then if this is Procyon, what does this star have to be? Pollux. And. Ah, can't get there. And Tester. And you can see this is the bright star up here, or Raga, the clear here, and that is called Capella. Jumping down here, we have the eye of the bull, Aldebaran, and there is a big loop, right? The Pleiades cluster, very cool. Okay, Venus, of course, is super bright tonight. Anyways, this is a neat little tool. You can practice your constellations if you want. I think I'm not going to go, oh, here's Algol, right? Algol. So you can practice your constellations, you can see things. You recognize any constellations, hopefully you do. Uh, by the way, let's try this real quickly. I actually, we've been teaching you, I just taught you something interesting, right? If you follow the arc of the handle of the big, of the big dipper, you arc to Arcturus, right? And this is gonna be the constellation Guotis, right? This is part of Guotis. Uh, if I turn on the lines, you can see, remember the ice cream cone? Who else is the ice cream cone? And you are to Arcturus, but what do you do next? You spike to spike them. It's a sideways spike, but that's what you do. So R to Arcturus, spike to spike. Anyways, it's a really cool tool. And um, oh, I just realized you can't hear me. Hey, can you guys hear me? For that website. I did. I posted the link on the web. I posted the link on the assignment. Hello, Irvin. Hello, Bridget. Hello, everybody. Okay, so I just realized I don't have my mic. Would you like a mic? I think I need, I need a mic. Give me a second. I'm going to get my mic. Okay, I left it in <laughs> TS101. Okay, I'm back. Are you guys here? Okay, that was a long time. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to get to work. We got stuff to do. So, uh, if you haven't tried it already, that link to the, um, the website is on the assignment. It's pretty cool. And then I found uh, Google Earth actually has a web version as well. So, 
So you can really practice your coordinate systems using these tools. All right. Okay, so I'm plugging in. And you guys are going to have to tell me if you can hear me once I plug this in. Tell me if this sounds better. Me, 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 me. Can you hear me? Anybody hear me? Hello, hear me? Can you hear me? I'm talking. Can you hear me? Okay. I think it's, yay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. So let me turn off the lights again. If you notice, this program actually um, uh, lets you zoom around and try different stars, and, and actually it's a good way to practice, and I, I'm going to bring this back up in just a minute. But for now, um, well, actually, why don't we talk about it right now? There is a, uh, can you guys see it? You can see it, huh? Okay. So you can actually see the stars. Um, I do want to point out that um, one of the tricks that we learned, uh, actually, if I advance time here, you go a couple more hours. You can see that um, you can see the Big Dipper here. See the Big Dipper, or some major. You take the handle of the Big Dipper and you arc to Arcturus, right? And then you spike to Spica, right? Those are two of the new stars. We're in, Arcturus is in the constellation of Bootes, and Spica is in the constellation of Virgo, the maiden, right? So uh, Puotis, the herdsman, and uh, Virgo, the maiden. So those will be kind of interesting a little bit later. But you can practice your stars. Uh, I did uh, show you these before, but I, I guess you couldn't hear me. But I was talking about all the stars over here. So for example, uh, you can see Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Saif. You see Sirius. If you jump up, you see Procyon. And here must be Pollux and Castor and Capella and Aldebaran. And we made a big circle here. Remember, it's called the Winter Hexagon. Okay, so that's a pretty cool tool. Another cool here uh, tool is Google Earth. So you don't see the poles, but you actually do see a beautiful globe. And you can see the equator and the vertical line here called the Prime Meridian. And where the Prime Meridian crosses uh, the equator down here off the coast of Africa. What is the name for that point? You guys might remember, we call that in the lab, we call it Z Drop a point over here somewhere. It doesn't matter. Let's say right here is the location of this point. So where's my cursor right here? And what you want to notice is this is the reference point, the origin. You can't hear me? No sound? Uh oh, hold on. Meridian crosses the equator, so it's called the Bomb. Right? That's the reference point. Bomb. That's the direction you go. So if I point to the cursor, man, it's a little bright. Okay, is that better? So can you see the cursor? Oh, you can't even see it. Okay, hold on. It's too bright. How's that? Okay. So if I if I look at the can you see it? Uh, I don't know if you can tell. It's really hard to see. Um, anyways, so if I go if I go here, watch my finger right here. If I go to here, let's go to this point right here. How many blocks did I move? Well, I moved over one, two blocks to the east. So that would be 20 degrees east longitude. And I went one block up. So that would be 10 degrees north 
latitude. Now, when you're using this on the web, you actually let your cursor hover over there and it shows you the coordinates. Now, I'm going to be testing you by showing you a picture and I may actually just take pictures like this on Google and then use them uh, on the web. I don't know what else I can do right now. And that way you'll be able to see, uh, maybe I'll try to give you a practice quiz over the break. But when I do give you your coordinate quiz, one of the things you have to do is identify the location of the point. Uh, we could try it again. Uh, let's try, let's try to go this way this time. So we're starting from the reference point. Ah, the lights came on. Hold on. How do the lights come on? They're accidentally coming on. Uh, okay. Confusing here. Uh, let's go, let's go this way. So again, you can see the reference point. The reference point is over here. So let's say I go all the way over to this point right here, right? And so if you count how many squares, I went four squares to the west this time. So that would be 40 degrees west longitude. And then I'm going up two squares. So that would be 20 degrees north latitude. Now the problem is that this shows you the numbers. So it's kind of too easy. But if you practice with this, I'm going to show you some pictures without any numbers. And basically, since you know that it's 10 degrees per block, you can figure it out pretty quickly. Okay? Well, that's one of the tools that you want to be able to play with. Another one is the... Okay, so that is the uh, terrestrial coordinate system. Another is uh, using Stellarium. I'm actually going to show you something. We have here the azimuthal grid. You see this button down at the bottom? Look towards the bottom. Can you guys see that? No, you can't. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Look to the bottom of the screen, and I'm going to show you the button to press. It's down at the bottom here. Look to the, my, the bottom right here. And it turns on the grid, and this is the uh, azimuth and altitude grid. Okay. So what you want to look for is a, a particular feature, a star or something like that. And we're going to try to locate the position. Okay, so... I don't see any numbers. Anybody see numbers? Okay, there are numbers way up at the top. Okay, so here's a trick. If you want to, uh, you can press F11 on your keyboard, and then it becomes full screen, and I still can't quite see. Oh, uh, here we go. Here are the numbers. So 195, 210. Uh, it looks like we're going by 15 degrees again, right? So let's try to figure out what is the location of Sirius. So this is 195. This line here, 195, 210. So what would the azimuth be, right? The azimuth. And so you're going to say, well, halfway between, oh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading it. 210 and 225. Can you read the numbers at the top? So midway between would be 217. What do you think? What would be a good value for this? Maybe 220. How about that? 220, something like that. Pretty close to 220 degrees azimuth. Now on the vertical, I can read this is 20 and this is 40. So it's between 20 and 40. What's midway between them going to be? About 30. So what would be the number here? Anybody want to figure that out? You might say something like, anybody got a number? maybe 28 degrees. Okay. Maybe 28 degrees. Okay. So if I click this, it's going to tell me the position. And sure enough, 220 degrees azimuth and 28 degrees altitude. So you can actually test yourself very quickly to see if you understand how azimuth and altitude works by using this application. So I would encourage you to try that out. I think it's actually pretty cool, pretty neat that you can do this. Okay, so I'm going to turn the lights on again. And actually, we're going to switch to your main topic. Okay, so the main topic of tonight and you want to take notes, please. So get out your notebook and uh, hit F11 again to get out of the full screen. And you can actually go to this uh, assignment here. And I have links to the Google Earth and the Stellarium web. And then I have the PowerPoint and I have a PDF file if you don't have PowerPoint. Okay, so you'll take the quiz when you're finished. And this link is for this current thing that obviously you got onto. So if I click this, I'm going to download it. I've already downloaded it. So here it is right here. 
and I'm going to go ahead and start you off. So what you want to do is find um, a page in the back of your lab manual and start taking some notes. This is the notes on stellar magnitude, right? So you'll see at the end of the course, this is one of the topics that we were supposed to cover, and we're covering it tonight. So stellar magnitude means the magnitude of stars, right? And so um, how bright are the stars? That's the question. How bright are the stars? And we're going to answer that question in a quantitative way tonight. So number one, oh, it's a lot of words. Okay, take a look up there in the corner. The intrinsic, why are stars, some stars bright? There's two factors to think about. One is called the luminosity. So I need your help. Can you read this or not? Can you guys read it? Or not? Can somebody tell me? Can you read it or not? Because I could zoom in maybe or something. Anybody? Can you read it? Yes, you can read it. Okay. I can't read it. Oh, I can read it. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can read it. Okay, so luminosity is up here. Luminosity is the power of a star. And the other factor is D, distance, the distance from us. So what is a star's luminosity? A star's luminosity is the amount of light energy per second that is radiating from the star. The units of energy per second are called watts, or capital W. Yes, just like a light bulb. In fact, some of the, the little joke that astronomers use is some stars are, dim, are bright bulbs and others are dim bulbs, right? So stars have, you can't read it, okay. So what you can do is download the, the, the PowerPoint uh, and then you'll be able to read it. So don't worry, just you know, go look at it afterwards. I'm sorry, I, I can't get it much closer than this. I should have zoomed in though. Uh, I can read it just fine, huh? All right, let me see, maybe it's my lens. Is that any better? Maybe not. Okay, well, sorry about that. Listen to my voice then. So the closer you are to a light source, the brighter it will appear. The apparent visual magnitude, this is a word that we're, we're learning tonight, is related to how bright a star appears to us from Earth. The apparent magnitude is the mag is the brightness from Earth. Okay, so here is a formula. Can you read this? Okay, the brightness formula is a measurement of of intensity. Actually, right? It's a measure of starlight. So it's called uh, the brightness. It's measured in uh, so the luminosity is measured in watts. And ooh, this is wrong. This oh yeah, distance is meters. Okay. But this is d squared, and so the brightness is the intensity watts per meter squared. So stars are bright because they are close or if they are very luminous. L is large. There's two ways. So in this formula, if d is small or if L is big, you get a lot of brightness. Okay? So you can, you can get brightness in more than one way. Well, that's kind of a problem, actually. Astronomers don't really like that. They want to be able to say, hey, this star is bright because, and give an answer. Uh, but it turns out you can't quite do that. So here we go. We're going to talk about history. And I'm going to tell you about this fellow by the name of Hipparchus. Okay. So apparently he was in uh, 190 to 120 BCE. And he created star charts. And he actually indicated how bright the stars were. So this was a new thing. He not only made pictures of the stars and put them in, in their or, organized fashion, but he also described them as, as having levels of brightness. And in fact, he described uh, six different levels of brightness. Okay, so he, he said he could see six families of stars, and he called the brightest one the first magnitude stars, and we kept that, right? And then the dimmest that he could see, he called the sixth magnitude star. So his, this is the key thing with magnitude. It's a little bit weird. And really, I would say it's kind of backwards. The dimmer the stars are, the higher the magnitude number will be. That's a little bit backwards, right? But you have to get used to that. Uh, so the lower a number is, the brighter it is. The higher the number on the magnitude scale, the, bright, the dimmer it will be, okay? So these are some numbers, and I realize my graphic got chopped off. Oops. Okay. But I want to start off. Actually, you know what I want to do is actually maybe turn this off for a moment and then just tell you a little story. Okay. So I'm going to turn this off just for a moment and tell you a little story. Okay. So the story goes like this. Hipparchus began with a scale that went from one to six, right? So how does a number line work? You guys have seen a number line before. You know, you start with, you know, you got your one right here and two right here and three, 
four, five, and six. Okay, so he saw a bunch of stars and he gave them numbers and they would be on the number line. But he apparently was not very well traveled because one of the stars that you and I know really well, Sirius, was not in his chart. And it's brighter than anything else. So what do you do if a star is brighter than a one? Anybody have an idea? What could you do with a star that's brighter than a one? Well, it's got to be lower. So what do you do? You can put in a zero right here. So now I want to share with you a few stars. So in your notes, I'd like you to make a note like this. Is there a star that we can talk about that has a magnitude of zero? And the answer is yes. There's a really famous star, and the name of that star is Vega. Now, Vega, you didn't learn this yet. It's really more of a summer star, but it's a really neat star. It turns out it will be our North Star one day in about 12,000 years. Keep that in mind. Uh, but in fact, Vega is a calibration star. It has a magnitude of zero. And so we use this when we do astrometry, when we measure the stars, we calibrate by knowing that Vega is a zero, we can then compare it to another star and say, hey, it's brighter or it's dimmer compared to Vega. Now, it turns out Vega is not the brightest star. So what do you do if you're getting brighter than a zero? You have no choice. What do you have to do? You have to go negative, right? So negative one, I'm still not to the brightest star. Negative two actually is too far, okay? So the brightest star, you know the name. The name is Sirius. That's something you need to know for your quiz tonight, so make sure you write that down. And Sirius has a magnitude of about negative 1.5, and that's the brightest star in the sky. So there is no star other than the sun, which is brighter than Sirius, in our, and definitely not in the night sky. That's kind of like the brightest uh, star, okay? Now, there are lots of things brighter than stars, though. What, what's brighter than a star? Not lots of things, a number of things. And one of them we've been seeing in the evening sky, super bright hanging up there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Super high hanging in the western part of the sky. Things like planets, right? Planets can be brighter than a star. So actually, it turns out, if I asked you what's the brightness of, say, Jupiter, and it turns out Jupiter right now is about negative two. Venus is brighter than that. So we got negative three. It turns out Venus at its brightest is about negative four. Make sure you write that down. So Venus, yeah, very good. I see somebody put Venus. Excellent. So Venus is about negative four. Now, again, that's pretty bright, right? Venus is a super bright object in the sky. Is there anything brighter than Venus, right? Anybody have an idea? What's brighter than Venus? And I know some of you are thinking about that. I know you can think about it, especially because it kind of ruins our stars sometimes when it's too bright. Uh, what is that thing that comes around once a month, right? The moon. That's right. The moon. Okay. So I'm going to actually break the scale a little bit because it's so far down. It turns out the moon, the full moon, is about negative 13. Okay, make a note. The full moon is about negative 13. Yes, moon. That's right. Good job. The moon. And what's even brighter than the moon? Anything brighter than the moon? Anything? Anything at all? And the answer is, of course, the sun, okay? So again, I have to break it and go way down here. And it turns out the sun, I would ask you to guess. Anybody want to guess? Uh, the sun, yes, that's right. What number could the sun be? Anybody want to guess? What number could the sun be? It's way down here. What do you think? Negative, negative, somebody give me a number. Sun, sun, sun. Very good. Negative. Give me a number, anybody? Okay. Uh, I'm going to put it down. Negative. See if you guessed right. Negative 27. About negative 27. Good. Very good. That's correct. Negative 27. So the sun is pretty much the brightest thing we can, we can talk about. There are things that are brighter than the sun. The sun is not. Very good. That's a good guess. Negative 20 is a good guess. It's a little bit more. Negative 27. Now, what about on the other side? Are there things that are brighter than six. I mean, sorry, larger number than six. And the answer is yes. In fact, you need to know something important. We kept something about Hipparchus's work. We said that this six is the dimmest star that you can see with the naked eye. So that's kind of important for you to know, right? Six is the dimmest star that you can see 
with the naked eye. So can you see the next number with the naked eye? A seven. And the answer is nope. You can't see a seven. You can't see an eight. You can't see anything higher than that. If you want to see those stars, then what do you need? You need some help. Binoculars or, like we've been using, a telescope, right? So I'm going to go ahead and, again, I'm going to break it. And I'm going to put a number right around here. Let's say like 12. A 12, positive 12, is what we, our little five-inch telescope. Okay? Now, what if I'm using the telescope that's inside the dome that's actually a 20-inch telescope? What do you think? Can it, can it see even further than this? And the answer is, well, yes, it collects more light. And it turns out we can even see, we can see 13s with that and probably 14s as well. So a 20-inch telescope might be able to get down a whole nother couple steps, right? Now, is there any telescope better than our 20-inch telescope? And the answer is, of course. Can you guys think of a telescope that's much better than that? And I have to break this again. And the answer is going to be the Hubble Space Telescope. That's pretty much the best, right? One of the best. And that one's about positive 30, right? I put the positive just to highlight that. Can you read that positive 30? Let me turn the screen just a bit, okay? Positive 30, put that in your notes, okay? The Hubble is about positive 30. So that's the range of magnitudes. It's huge, right? It's such a huge range that, um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of crazy to be able to talk about such a huge range. But what does it even mean, right? What does it actually mean to have these different numbers? Tonight, we're going to understand exactly what it means, right? How does it, ch how does it change the brightness to your eye when you see a star of a different magnitude? Now, before I do that, though, let me just throw out one more thing. And that is a simple, simple idea that you guys can understand. What happens if you're looking at a star, right, from a certain distance? Let's put a distance D. Right? You're and somewhere on this circle here. You're watching that star. Okay? And then you get on a rocket ship and you go another D away. So now you're twice as far away, right? You're at position when you were here, position A, you saw one thing. What will you see when you go over here? Do you see something brighter or dimmer? And the answer is the star has a certain luminosity, right? So when you're at A. The brightness will be the luminosity divided by 4 pi d squared. Right? That's what it'll be, whatever the numbers are. There's no numbers in this, in this thing. So I want you to try to just think, like, what's going on right here? So what happens when you go to, when you go to the, the second place? I should have put 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. How about that? 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, because then I don't have another b here. Sorry about that. So what's the brightness when you get out here? Well, the luminosity hasn't changed. It's the same star, but what's different? We're now twice as far from the star. And so we have to square that. What happens when you square the number two? What do you get? And the answer is you get L divided by four pi, four D squared, which means you get one fourth of this original thing. So the idea is if you go twice as far from the star, you have one fourth the intensity or one fourth the brightness. What if you go 10 times as far, right? Just thinking about that. If you go 10 times as far, you have to remember that that factor of 10 gets squared. So what will happen? The star will be 1 over 10 squared, 1 one hundredth as bright. So again, this is a little more advanced. We don't really do a lot of calculations in this class. I just want to introduce you to the concept of magnitude and why it changes uh, and how it changes uh, when you talk about the brightness changing, uh, when you change the distance, okay? So that's just a simple uh, idea of what we could do. Okay, but now let's go back to our slide presentation. And remember, you can follow along at home or download it and uh, look at it later. And you're putting notes in here. We have a lot of questions, by the way. We don't really know what to do, right, with the rest of this class. How do we do this with you guys not 
meeting to look at the telescopes? I don't have an answer yet. So those of you who are wondering what's going to happen, I don't know yet. So we're going to figure it out, though. Don't worry. And by the way, I'm always on your side. So we're going to find a way to make it so you get your full credit and everybody's happy, okay? So we don't want to... We don't want to screw you guys up. Okay, so we're back to our slideshow. And now you can see some of the same things I showed you, right? The naked eye limit, what's the number? It doesn't show here, but try to remember what it is. It is positive six, right? That's the limit of a, mo a naked eye. Actually, look at this one. What number do you think Polaris is, according to this? Anybody want to guess? It's about what? About positive two, right about here, positive two. Serious, you remember what it is? Negative 1.5 and Venus right here, about negative four. Okay, full moon, negative 13, and all the way down here, the sun, negative 27. Yeah, good guess, good guess. That was great. All the way up on the other side, remember Hubble was near 30. Actually, I really think it's close to 30, but anyways. So you want to write down something important. This is an idea that's kind of important. Why are stars bright? I already told you there's two answers. Either they have a big luminosity or they have a small distance. They're close to us, right? Astronomers don't like that. They want to have a, a more clear way to describe stars. So I want you to know that there's actually two kinds of magnitude. One is called the apparent visual magnitude. And it says, how bright is that star as is seen from Earth? But we also created something called the absolute magnitude. So make sure you write that down. Uh, the letter for absolute magnitude, I don't know why it's missing from here, is capital M. Make sure you write that down, capital M. I must have written it in another place. I can't believe I wouldn't do that. And what it is, is the apparent magnitude of a star when it is seen from a distance of 10 parsecs. Just write that down. Appar the absolute magnitude. You move the star to the same distance, always 10 parsecs from the Earth. That's 32.6 light years, if you didn't remember that. Just write down both of those. And you ask, what is the apparent magnitude at that distance? Okay. So this is called the absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude, capital M. So little m for apparent magnitude, capital M for absolute magnitude. Okay, so I, I went into Wikipedia just for fun and grab the top, actually the top 100, but I'm showing you the top 20 stars. Can you guys read this at all? I, anyways, I put the link there. You should go visit it yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you can read this. Okay, well, you know these. First of all, Sol, that's our sun. Next one, Sirius. Canopus, you may not know, but how about Rigel? Yes, you know Rigel. And then, uh, actually, this is not the Rigel that we know. Never mind, Rigel. Centaurus and Ptolemon. I don't know that one. That's an Alpha Centaurus. Uh, Arcturus, we know. Vega, Capella, Rigel, Procyon, Akamar, Betelgeuse, I don't know. Altair, we don't know. Acro Aldebaran, we know. Spica, we just learned. Pollux, and that's about it. Okay, so we know a bunch of these stars, though, and these are the brightest stars. I would like to notice right here, this is called the Bayer designation. It's a minor little thing. But you see the little symbol right there? That symbol is alpha, right? The Greek letter alpha. And so what does this mean? Sirius is alpha canis major, right? Alpha canis major. And this one, Canopus, is called alpha carina. And this one is alpha centaurus, alpha buotis, alpha lyra, alpha origa, alpha orion, al alpha uh, canis minor, right? The alpha star is the brightest star in the constellation. This one is Beta Orion. Sorry, that's Beta. That would be the second brightest. Although right now, Rigel is brighter than Betelgeuse. Remember that? And then take a look right here. Actually, these are the brightest stars in, in their order. They're in order. But if you look right here, look at the distance. And you see the first one, 8.6, 310, 4.4, 37, 25, 42, 860, 11, 140, 640, 350, 17, 320, 65, 600, 260, 34, 25, 2,600. Okay, so you might notice that these stars are not the same distance at all, right? It's kind of crazy. So what are the brightest stars? Why are the brightest stars bright? It turns out just by coincidence 
about half of them are, are bright because they are closer and half of them are bright because their luminosity is so great, okay? Uh, there's another column over here called the spectral class and we probably won't have to deal with that too much, but it's kind of a cool thing just to know that our sun is a G2V. That's the original G2V, okay? The original G2V, that's the classification of our sun. Again, this link is in the PowerPoint, so you can look at it more carefully. There's actually a hundred stars, uh, so that's pretty neat. You, you will definitely know more of those stars as well. Okay, so let's take a look right here. Um, I'm gonna ask you to learn the difference exactly numerically, not exactly, but pretty close, friendly. Uh, uh, when the difference of one magnitude number, two magnitude numbers, and five magnitude numbers. I'm going to ask you to memorize this. So I'm going to give you the first one because you need to know, right? You just need to know. Here it is. How much brighter is a magnitude three star than a magnitude four? Now, before I go any further, how did you know that three was brighter than a four? Well, three is lower than four. So the lower you go, the brighter it is, right? Does that make sense? So how much brighter is a three than a four? I have to tell you this. So the answer is it is two and a half times as bright, okay? So that's something you just have to memorize. How much brighter? When you take one step, it doesn't matter where you start, by the way. If you drop by one number, it's because it's two and a half times brighter, okay? So it could be from a five to a four or from a 10 to a nine, right? Or from a... A negative one to a negative two. As if you drop by one, it's brighter, two and a half times brighter. So let's try the next one. And by the way, this is where some of you are going to screw up. Pay attention. Okay. Pay attention. Well, how much brighter is a magnitude two star than a magnitude four star? Well, first of all, remember, lower number means brighter. And now we've taken two steps, right? From a four down to a two is two steps down. So why don't you guess? See if you can guess right now. I'll give you a moment uh, to guess. But you've taken two steps. One step was two and a half times as bright. What is two steps going to be? Okay. Now, if I had you in person, I know some of you are going to mess up, and that's okay. I want you to figure it out. It's no big deal. Just guess, right? Okay, you don't want to guess. All right. Maybe you're a little delayed uh, behind that. Ten times. Ooh, good guess. Two ten. Ten times, okay? And the answer is not ten times. That was a good guess. Uh, but the answer is, what do you think? It's not five. If you thought five, you want to understand that's not right, right? Because two and a half plus two and a half is five. But this is two and a half times as bright. Every time you step, every step you take is a factor of 2.5. And so the right answer is... 2.5 squared, 2.5 times 2.5, which is 6.25 times as bright, okay? Now, that's not too bad. You memorized one step, you memorized two steps, but now you're like, why am I memor memorizing five, Sean? Because we wanna do mental math, right? How much brighter, we're gonna go back to the original numbers. How much brighter is a magnitude one than a magnitude six? Again, one is lower than six, it must be brighter. Now we've taken five steps, right? From six down to five is five steps lower. And so the answer is 2.5 to the fifth power. Everybody can do that in their head, right? I'm just kidding. Very few people can. And the answer is 2.5 to the fifth power, which happens to be 100 times, which is kind of a nice, easy number. In fact, that's where it comes from. Why 2.5? And the answer is so that we can make it so that a magnitude star that Hipparchus saw would be a hundred times as bright as a magnitude six. If you do that, you have a beautiful scale, which we call the magnitude scale, okay? So what do we do with this? What's the useful information? I do realize now that I did not talk about absolute magnitude, huh? Oh, I didn't do that, okay. Maybe let me stop then and talk about absolute magnitude, okay? Let me stop, stop talk about absolute magnitude. I left it out. That's a flaw in my slide set. Sorry about that. But I will fix it. I will add the material. So what is absolute magnitude? It is
<laughs> All right, let's fix that. Okay, so the absolute magnitude, the idea is that you no longer have to worry about the stars being different luminosities and different distances. Now we're going to take the star wherever it is, and we're going to move it to a distance of uh, 10 parsecs. So here, write this down. Big M, which is absolute magnitude. What is this? It's the apparent magnitude, I know, right? When, when the star is seen from 10 parsecs. Okay, so if you don't know what that is, one parsec is 3.26 light years, and we abbreviate that as 1PC, right? 1PC. One parsec is 3.2626 light years. What about 10 parsecs? What would that be? And the answer is 32.6 light years, okay? So that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Why did we do that? Well, if you look at the formula for brightness, And, and before, we had this problem where you, had, you have different luminosities, you have different distances. What happens when you do absolute magnitude? And the answer is, you don't have different distances anymore. So in the absolute magnitude scale, if a star is, is brighter or has you know, more, more intensity, it is because it has a greater luminosity. So that will be a lower capital M. Capital M will be a lower number. Okay, so how does this work? What do you have to know? You don't have to know a lot, by the way, but I do want to teach you just a little tiny bit about that. So before I go any further, let me ask you a question. Is it possible that a star could, um, could be 10, 10 parsecs from us? Could it already be 10 parsecs from us? And what would that mean, right? What would it mean if it was 10 parsecs from us already, right? So if, let's suppose here we are on Earth, right, here's on Earth, and there's a star over here, and that star is 10 parsecs, oops, not 12, 10 parsecs from the Earth, right? And I tell you the magnitude, right? I tell you the magnitude, um, the magnitude is positive, positive one, okay? The magnitude, the little m, the apparent magnitude is little m. What is big M? Right, what's big M? Well it's already 10 parsecs away. And so what's the answer? What's the answer, huh? And the answer is, it's the same number, right? It's the same number. So wait, so that if the star was already 10 parsecs, then these two numbers match, right? These two numbers are gonna match. What if that star was a different, let's try something different, right? Let's try, let's suppose it's at uh, five, you know, well, actually, you don't have to know that. How about one parsec? Yeah, this is something that we could do. One parsec. Suppose it's one parsec, and the number here, the magnitude is uh, positive two, like that. Okay, positive two. Right? Everybody good? So it's positive two. What's going to happen when, when I talk about the absolute magnitude? Well, where, does it, where do I have to move the star? And the answer is not one parsec. Where do you have to move it to? 10 parsecs away. Wow, I'm going to go off the screen. <laughs> okay, I can't do that. Let's just pretend that I went that far. Let's go 10 parsecs now. All right, the star has moved to 10 parsecs. So what do you notice? It's a lot further than before. What's going to happen to the brightness, right? So what just happened? We went from one parsec to 10 parsecs, right? So this one, the brightness was whatever the luminosity was over 4 pi times 1 parsec squared. But here, there's going to be 10 parsecs squared, right? So what's going to end up happening? You're going to get 1 over 10 squared, 1 one hundredth L over 4 pi 1 PC squared. 
it's going to be one one hundredth as bright. So do you remember that factor of a hundred? That's what happens. You change by a factor of hundred. You change the magnitude by five numbers. So what should it be if you go further away? Should it be brighter or dimmer? Okay, number one. What should it be? Brighter or dimmer? And the answer is, of course, dimmer, right? So, so what should happen to the number? Should it go up or go down? And the answer is to be dimmer, we have to go up. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to tell you that the absolute magnitude is five magnitude numbers higher because of this factor of 100. It's going to be positive seven like that. Okay. Yep. You go up. Very good. Good, good, good. Okay. So Peter, don't worry. Um, by the way, you should go back and watch the beginning because there is some information that you missed and just make sure you get the whole thing. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so the magnitude, the absolute magnitude can be bigger if you started closer than 10 parsecs. But what if, what if uh, the star started closer, uh, further than 10 parsecs? Maybe, maybe the star is... Maybe the star is 20 parsecs from the Earth already, right? Maybe the star is 20 parsecs. 20 parsecs. And it has some magnitude. What's going to happen if we bring it to 10 parsecs? What's going to happen? So if I put m equals positive 2, this might be a little too much work, huh? Ah, it's not going to be easy. I picked, I picked a hard number. Let me pick, um, let me pick an easier number. How about... Um, well, 100 parsecs would be easy. That would be easy. You want to try that one? Let's try that. Suppose it starts at 100 parsecs. Then what happens when you bring it to 10 parsecs, right? Now, instead of it's going to be just 10 parsecs, it's going to be 10 times closer. It's going to be 100 times as bright. So if the magnitude is positive to here, what would the absolute magnitude have to be? Well, it's going to be a brighter star because it's so much closer. And 100 times brighter is five magnitude steps. But this time, because it's brighter, we're going to step down. And so the answer is positive 2, down 1, positive 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3 would the answer be. Okay, that's actually a little too advanced. Don't worry about it. Okay, good. Yes, Peter, you got that. Okay. So now what do you want to know, though? Let me just tell you what you want to know. Let's take our little sun, our beautiful little sun, our soul, right? Our soul, right? Well, the, the apparent magnitude is negative 27. What do you think the absolute magnitude would be? A bigger number or a smaller number? Which one? Is it going to be lower and more negative or higher? Which one? What do you think? And the answer is we're going to move it from 1 AU to 32.6 light years. What do you think happens? It's going to go up, right? It's going to go up. And the answer is, what is the absolute magnitude of our sun? Positive five. It's a big change. In fact, positive five. Think, tell me about that. Is that a very bright star or not a very bright star? And the answer is, well, it's almost six, which is the dimmest star we can see. Our sun is not a super bright star, right? It's kind of like middle of the road. Okay. It's not the dimmest star either, but it's definitely not the brightest star. Okay, so I have corrected my little uh, mistake, and now I've added in a little bit of information on absolute magnitude. Let's go back to the slide set and finish this up. So what you're going to do with this information is I'm going to ask you to do some homework, but you have a little, you have a little time. You have a couple weeks, okay? But I, I want to tell you about it, and I'm going to actually go over something with you tonight to help you see how it works. And the page that we're talking about is page 12A, 12B. So if you can open up your lab notebook to page 12A, 12B, then you can follow along with me. You'll understand what I'm talking about, okay? So if you go to page 12A and B, first of all, I can't read this on the screen. Can you? Okay. I can read it up here, but anyways. Um, there's a whole bunch of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And the question is, which ones do you have to do? Well, number one is the northern circumpolar constellations. What do you think? Yes, you got to do those. Okay. How about B, Buotes, and a little tiny piece of, um, of the Big Dipper, by the way, which allows you to arc to Arcturus, spike to Spica. And the answer is definitely yes. How about Leo and Cancer? What do you think? Yes. 
How about Gemini, Origa, Taurus, Orion, Canis, Minor, and Sirius? Yes. Okay. How about Perseus, Triangulum, and Aries? Yes. How about Cygnus, Lyra, Delphina, Sagitta? Nope. How about Pegasus and Andromeda? Not anymore. Capricorn, Aquarius? Nope. And Scorpius, Sagittarius? Nope. Okay, so you have to do A, B, C, D, E, and that's worth, um, you know, 10 points. So please try to do your best. But what your goal is, is to use the numbers that they give you to figure out the numbers, the, the stars that are not listed. Okay, so I'll show you that in just a moment. Actually, in fact, right now with, uh, oh, let's talk for a second here, okay? So how are you supposed to do this? You don't have to worry about the 2.5 very much. What I want you to do is compare two stars and ask, first of all, are they the same, right? If they're the same brightness, so you're gonna, for each constellation, use the reference star magnitudes to estimate the magnitudes of the others, okay? So if you see, if they give you a number in the constellation, you're going to look at that number and you're going to ask, well, how do the other stars compare? If they're the same brightness, then you just copy the number, right? Just copy it. They're the same. They're the same magnitude. If the second star looks twice as bright, right? And that's good enough. It doesn't have to be 2.5. We're going to just be approximate, right? If it looks to your eye like twice as bright, then you're going to lower the number by one, right? You're going to drop it because it's brighter. And the other way, if the second star is half as bright, then you raise the number by one. If it doesn't look like it's that much, right, but it's closer than that, then you can maybe um, raise it or drop it, drop it by a half, okay? But that's it. Never try to do better than that. So if I see you putting 2.1 or something like that or 1.46, I know that you cheated. And please don't bother. I don't care if you cheat. Why cheat? Just go out and look at the stars and try to estimate. I'm going to practice with you so you understand how easy this is. It's not meant to be really difficult, but look at the stars and see, see how you can do, okay? Don't try to be too precise. That's a sign that you cheated, okay? Because you can go look up the numbers, but I don't want you to. I just want you to try it, okay? So I have a, uh, a constellation. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to have to sketch it out for you. Uh, there's Polaris, though. Everybody knows Polaris, okay? Okay. All right. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to sketch it out here. Can you see the red light? Oh, yes, you can. So from Polaris, we're going to come down and here are the stars. And then this is the dipper part. This is the dipper. Okay. Everybody see that? Okay. Now, in this, in this constellation, they tell you Polaris is a magnitude positive 2. That's a positive 2. Are there any other stars that look like that? Well, <laughs> this one right here, doesn't it look just about the same? Its name is Kochab. We didn't learn that one. But that's about the same. So I would go ahead and just copy positive two to that particular thing. Now in your, in your sheet, in your worksheet, it's upside down. This is, this is actually the other, it's, it's like this. So you're going to have to think about what that means, but the curve of the handle is here. And then this is the dipper part. Okay. So they give you this is positive two. And I'm going to say that one is the same positive two. They give you this one is positive three. Now, before I do anything, does that make sense? Does this look like it is half as bright as this? And the way this program works is the size is actually giving you information on the magnitude. So I think it is about half as big, and so that actually makes sense to me, okay? Now, are there any other stars in the neighborhood that are the same brightness? And the answer is no, there are none. But if I look at this one and this one, I think this one is about half as bright as this. So if this is a three, what would be a reasonable number here for this star? Oh, they also give you this star, by the way, is a five. Okay, we could use that too. Let's use that. So that dim little star here is a five. What about this one right here? I would say that it's about twice as bright. What do you think? And so if this is a five, what would this one be? Anybody? And I would say twice as bright it's gonna be a four, it'll drop by one. 
And now I look at these and I'm going to say they're pretty much the same. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty much the same. So I'm going to say four, four. Okay, so we've got a, a two, a four, a four, a four, a two, a three, and a five. Okay, so I just showed you a demonstration of what you're supposed to be doing. And the goal is that you go out into the night sky and you look at the stars and you try it for yourself and try to figure out what the constellations magnitudes are. Okay. Okay. So let's see, what else do we have to do? Um, uh, that is actually the end of the lecture for now. Wow. That was quick. I thought it would be a little bit longer. Um, I think that's it for tonight. So what you want to do is there is a participation quiz. And uh, what you're going to do is take that in order to get the participation points. You should be practicing your constellations. And I would encourage you to go ahead and download or just start using the websites um, that I mentioned to you today where you can practice the coordinate systems. You want to practice the terrestrial system. Let's see. You want to just quickly go through those? Let's see if we can go through this. Uh, pages 12A and 12B are your homework, but you actually have a little bit of time to do them because next week is spring break. I actually don't expect you to do anything. But if you want to, that'd be great. Like, just go look at the stars. You know, that'd be awesome. Uh, but in fact, uh, let's talk about the coordinate systems again. Okay, so just a quick review. In the generalized system, we have a bunch of things. We have two primary poles, right? The top and the bottom where the intersection of the axis with the sphere. We have the primary great circle. We have the secondary great circles, which wrap around from pole to pole. We have the secondary small circles, which are parallel to the primary great circle and get smaller as you go up to the pole. Uh, we have the reference point, and we have the coordinate measured along or uh, parallel to the primary great circle. That should be the x-axis. And the coordinate measured perpendicular to the primary great circle, that should be your y-axis. Okay, that's the general thing. In the terrestrial system, what do you call the two primary poles? North pole, south pole. What do you call the primary great circle? Celest uh, no, sorry, the equator. <laughs> equator, right? What do you call the secondary great circles which wrap around from pole to pole? They're called the meridian lines, right? And the special one is called the prime meridian, right? When are 12, go look, look on, yeah, two weeks from today. That's right. Correct. Two weeks from today uh, is 12A and 12B. And then uh, primary prime meridian is the special meridian line. What do you call the reference point? Oh, sorry. What do you call the secondary small circles on the terrestrial system? They're called parallels of latitude, right? That's what they're called because that's what they're measuring. Uh, what do you call the coordinate? So the reference point on the Earth is called Zonk, and it's where the prime meridian crosses the equator. Prime meridian crosses the equator. Uh, what do you call the coordinate measure parallel to the equator? Called longitude. What do you call the coordinate perpendicular? It's called latitude. Okay. Jumping to the next system. It's called the horizontal system where we have, ooh, I know what I forgot to do. I forgot to show you this. Let me show you something else. Let me go back. Turn off the lights for a second. Let me show you this. I forgot to show you. This is so cool. Okay. Zoom. Uh, escape. That's right. Escape. Okay, hold on. Get out of the slideshow. Get over here. Let's go here. If you click this one, can you guys see this? Hold on. Oh, yeah. So you see the little circle right next to that? It says equatorial grid, right? And this is going to allow me to practice equatorial, right? So this is the equatorial grid, okay? Now, you'll notice the important point in the sky, right? This is Polaris right here. This is the North Celestial Pole. So you can actually see, right, the stars are rotating around. Oh, that got bright. Okay. There's a way to turn off atmosphere. Here we go. Turn off the atmosphere, and then you can just see the stars rotating around. Right? And so that's rotating around Polaris. Okay. Um, and then, what do you, let's rotate to the south here. When you look at this, you want to notice there are... Um, let me go ahead and make it full screen again. F11. F11 to make it full screen. If you look along here, you'll notice that there are hour lines right here. So this is the 15 hour line. 
This is the 14 hour line. And so when I look at this, actually, you can kind of figure out what do you think you would say about Arcturus? So it's between 14 and 15. It's not in the middle. By the way, if it was in the middle, what would it be? It would be 14 hours and 30 minutes. But it looks like it might be in the middle of the middle, right? Or about one quarter of the way across. So what would be a good estimate? Well, I'm going to say 14 hours and about 15 minutes of right ascension. That's called right ascension. Uh, looking along here, I have to look for some lines here. That's positive 40. This is positive 20. I'm going to say it's like positive 19 right here. And so if you click on it, it's going to actually tell you the coordinates. Let's see if I was correct. Okay, so I said the right ascension, 14 hours and 16 minutes. That's pretty close to what I said, right? And then the, the, the declination is positive 19, just like I said. So if you get, if you use this app on the web, you can really practice for yourself. Don't, don't uh, look up the numbers right away. See if you can estimate them. Then click on the star and see if your numbers are correct. So this will be one of the things that I test you when I finally give you a coordinate system quiz which will probably be, it'll be sometime after the break. Maybe, is it right after the break? It might be right after the break, the week after the break. Uh, so that's the second. Okay. All right. I'm turning the lights back on. Close your eyes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for you tonight. So um, thank you very much for coming. And please look at the stars. Practice your constellations. Practice what we just talked about tonight. And now you have a new homework assignment for after the break. Okay, please take care of yourself. By the way, you guys are in a vulnerable group. Uh, you want to be just careful, okay? It turns out, uh, we just found out tonight that a City College student tested positive. Uh, and it, it was only in one class, so that's good. But um, it's also a City College student. So just take care of yourself. Please be careful and uh, come back healthy and happy so we can enjoy ourselves and after the break. Okay. So thank you so much and good night. Bye.